Welcome back to Czech Ambrosia. Do you remember the Duran? How about the Windchip? The MP6? The Media GX? The Sempron? Budget CPUs aren't exactly at the top of anyone's most memorable tech gadget lists, but there's one whose name I can say that you'll recognize immediately, and it'll probably make you roll your eyes. Celeron. If you've spent any time in tech, you're probably familiar with the Celeron, bemoaned lowest of low-end desktop CPUs from Intel, with performance hobbled beyond what's reasonable in a budget processor, seemingly out of pure contempt. Contempt not only for the CPU itself, but for those of us who'd buy it. You could say the Celeron has something of a reputation, but how did it get this reputation? Does it deserve it? And where did all this start? Today, I'm examining the first Celeron. I said the first Celeron. The real first Celeron. Imperfection. <laughs> Intel launched the Celeron on slot 1 back in April of 1998. They needed a low-cost CPU to woo budget PC shoppers away from Socket 7, a platform which had been Intel's cash cow just a couple of years earlier, but which was quickly becoming a competition battleground among third-party CPU manufacturers. Intel's continued losses in the courts simply solidified this, enabling rivals such as Cyrix and AMD to continue manufacturing and selling their own CPUs on what was once Intel's bread-and-butter PC platform. Probably the biggest nail in that platform's coffin, from Intel's point of view, was IBM choosing AMD's K6 CPUs as the basis of their new budget-friendly Aptiva line of PCs. IBM, creator of the PC, not selling Intel. It was a major deal at the time, and a significant amount of egg on Intel's face. Thus, Intel faced the eternal capitalist dilemma. How do you get price-conscious shoppers, the majority of buyers, onto your exclusive platform and lock them in, without also cannibalizing the sales of high-margin products already on said platform? Well, you take an existing product, and you make it worse, and sell it for less money, hoping the volume makes up for the lower margins. And that is exactly what they did with the Celeron. Intel's top-of-the-line chip at the time was the Deschutes Pentium 2, a die-shrunk version of the original Clamath core able to hit speeds of 400 MHz. A 450 MHz version launched later that year, while consuming about half the power of the previous core. Deschutes, like Clamath, used a half megabyte pool of backside level 2 cache on the processor card, running at half the CPU speed. It was this backside level 2 cache that Intel targeted when designing the Celeron, aiming it to make it both less expensive to produce and sufficiently slower than day shoots in order to preserve sales of their cache cow Pentium 2 systems to high-end users and businesses. And targeted they did. The first Celerons, codenamed Covington, launched without any level 2 cache whatsoever. Initial sales were strong as people were very keen on a less expensive Pentium 2 class CPU. However, Enthusiasm quickly tapered off as the performance of the new chips became apparent. The Celeron was slow. Some outlets reported testing Celeron 266s that could only barely edge out the Pentium 233 MMX CPUs they were replacing. Intel was in hot water again. In what was probably the fastest manufacturing mea culpa I've ever seen in my life, Intel reversed course, and less than six months after launching Covington, they launched another new Celeron core, Mendocino. Mendocino added back level 2 cache, but not in the same way that the Deschutes core it was based on used it. Instead of a relatively large pool of L2 cache next to the CPU on the PCB, running on a dedicated backside bus at half the CPU clock speed, Mendocino was the first retail CPU to move all the level 2 cache onto the CPU die. This seems a little overkill for a budget CPU, on-die level 2 cache is extremely fast and rather expensive to produce since it takes up so much die area that it can't be used for anything else. This is pure speculation on my part, but my guess about why they did this was that they had boatloads of these CPU cards in warehouses 
ready to be made into Covington Celerons. They had to bank on volume with this product, remember? And in order to turn a project like this around as quickly as they did, they'd have had to use what they had on hand, and their particular expertise. Intel makes CPU dies. I know, shocking. Subscribe for more amazing facts. So when they needed to add cache to the Celeron, they put it in the one place they had the most control over, the CPU die itself. Now, with the cache on the die, it had to run at the same speed as the CPU. So in order to hobble performance a sufficient amount for a budget CPU, Intel quartered the amount of cache versus day shoots from 512 kilobytes to 128 kilobytes. It worked. It restored the performance of the Celeron's P6 core, and in some cases, it worked too well, making the new Celerons faster than equivalent Pentium 2s. This was the pattern that Intel would follow for the next 10 or 15 years, take the current desktop CPU, cut down the front side bus speed, the clock speed, or the level 2 cache, or all three, and sell it as a Celeron for cheap. In some cases, this yielded very interesting and good value consumer processors, such as the Sandy Bridge-based Celerons and the absolutely legendary Coppermine 128s. In other cases, like the Pentium 4-based Celerons, the resulting chips were derided for poor performance and extremely poor value. But that's not the end of the Celeron story. There's one final page, and that page was written by people willing to do horrible things to PC hardware in the name of finding the ragged edge. Enthusiasts and overclockers. While the Celeron built a lukewarm reputation in the mainstream market, the early chips based on the Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 cores quickly made a name for themselves as extremely competent overclockers. Despite being multiplier locked, it was discovered early on that the Mendocino and Covington cores overclocked extremely easily. In many cases, it was found that the 300 MHz Celerons could be pushed to 450 MHz simply by raising the front side bus speed from the Celerons 66 MHz to the Pentium 2's 100 MHz, with practically no tweaking necessary. This meant that those budget-friendly chips could suddenly rival the fastest CPUs Intel had on offer, bar none. Most enthusiasts attributed this to Intel's removal of the external Level 2 cache chips from the CPU cards, which freed the CPU from their finicky and relatively low-speed operation. That brings me quite nicely to my benchmark tests. I have 300 MHz versions of both Covington and Mendocino here, and I put them through their paces against CPUs that would have been their contemporaries. Unfortunately, my particular Slot 1 motherboard isn't terribly high performance, and wouldn't let me select a 100 MHz frontside bus for either of these CPUs. However, I was able to push them both to 375 MHz on an 83 MHz bus, resulting in some interesting performance numbers. Eventually, I will have a slot 1 board that's more capable of overclocking these CPUs, and when I do, I'll make a video talking about overclocking and its importance to the value segment in this, in this era. For now, though, I tested these against my Klamath Pentium 2 266, my Katmai Pentium 3 500, as well as several Socket 7 CPUs that would have been found in low-cost PCs in 1998. The Cyrix M2 and Media GX, Pentium MMX 233, and my K62 standing in for IBM's Aptiva, which was most commonly found running a K6 266. I couldn't get my M2-233G piece stable for these tests, so I substituted my 6x86MX PR200 instead. Alright, let's get into the benchmarks. I started by running my usual DOS bench tests on each system to get an idea of how they handle DOS stuff. It turns out, if you overclock a Mendocino Celeron, it turns into a beastly DOS machine, winning three of the four DOS tests and turning in over 100 frames per second in Doom. Next up is Quake, which I tested at 320x200 in DOS to get a baseline, and then switched over to Windows and GL Quake with my Voodoo 3 to see how much each system sped up when the game's rendering was hardware accelerated. Unsurprisingly, the cacheless Celerons saw the most speed up when they no longer had to write to main system RAM instead of L2 to render every frame. Performance is great on all the Slot 1 systems, with the P3 coming in first place, but the Celeron A bringing a fight for a close second with 108 FPS when paired with the Voodoo. The Covington is no slouch here either, turning in 86 FPS at stock speeds when paired with the Voodoo and 101 when overclocked. 
Following on from Quake, we have Quake 2, which definitely prefers fast cash over large cash, with the Pentium 3 and overclocked Mendocino trading in first and second place in hardware and software rendering. It's a really great showing for the Celeron here, and you can see why the 300A had such a favorable reputation among PC gaming enthusiasts. Also notable is that the Covington Celeron shows the greatest speed up when hardware acceleration is added to the mix, delivering over double the frame rate for a very respectable 51 FPS at stock speed and 64 FPS overclocked. The last two games I tested are much harder for all of these CPUs to run, Quake 3 and Hidden and Dangerous. Quake 3 actually works really nicely as a pretty generic CPU performance comparison, owing to its broad optimization and lack of special treatment of any particular CPU architecture. You can see this demonstrated most clearly in the K6 versus Pentium results, where the K6 has been trailing the Pentium in Quake 1 and Quake 2, it turns in a full 50% more frames in Quake 3, finally showing the world what K6 enthusiasts have been trying to say since the architecture's debut. Quake 3 is pretty brutal for all the CPUs here, however, with the Pentium 3 only turning in 45 FPS at 640x480, and the overclocked Mendocino right behind it with 38. Covington's lack of L2 cache really hurts it in this test, with it only turning in 18 FPS at stock, and a whopping 23 when overclocked. This is another game where the importance of fast cache appears to outweigh large cache, with Mendocino at stock speeds outperforming the Klamath Pentium 2. The last game here is Hidden and Dangerous, a DirectX title from 1999. While its graphics are clearly inferior to Quake 3's, its frame rates are as well. Everything in this lineup struggled with this game, with the exception of the Pentium 3, which suggests SSE acceleration somewhere in the rendering pipeline, though the game's manual makes no mention of it. I start the first mission, auto-assign a loadout and team, and walk down the riverbank until I can just start to see the bridge. The music changes and I let the game sit there for a while while I record the frame rate with fraps. Anyway, <laughs> it's a disaster for everyone here, though the K6 manages to edge, edge out the Covington Celeron at stock clocks, with the rest of Socket 7 turning in single digits. Slot 1 sees sub 30 FPS for everything that's on a Pentium 3 here, with the cashless Covington unable to even surpass the Pentium 2 when overclocked. I did some brief testing in Heroes 3, but all of the Slot 1 systems played the game well. Uh, the P3 was a little smoother, but mostly it was just a bloodbath for the Socket 7 machines, all of which struggle with the game's enormous amount of animations and 800x600 resolution. Most of the complaints about the original Celerons stemmed from their poor performance in Office application benchmarks. This doesn't have as much bearing today as it did back then, because there's very little likelihood that you're building a retro PC to do hardcore productivity with. I mean, unless you're doing one of those wild YouTuber challenges where you have to do your day job on a retro PC or something like that. That would be... that'd be awful. I mean, I would eventually like to look at making a retro PC useful in today's world, but that's going to be a future video. The trouble with benchmarking office productivity is that, short of doing things like 3D rendering or video editing, it's kind of a stretch to build a test that's going to stress out an office app to the point where you can actually measure meaningful differences between a set of CPUs. To that end, I've, I've got two tests. A small PowerPoint presentation in Office 97 that uses a lot of clip art, as well as a large word art object at the end that takes a lot of time to render. The difference between the CPUs is pretty minor, as you can see, and really only served to highlight how unoptimized Microsoft's gradient rendering was in 1998. The second test, though, is a little more interesting, because it takes long enough that differences actually begin to emerge between the CPUs. This is a world map PDF from mapsofworld.com. It's relatively large, but still compatible with Adobe Reader 5 running in Windows 98, so the test is literally just opening this immense PDF. The Pentium 3, unsurprisingly, aces this test, taking just 15 seconds to render the map, but Overclocked Mendocino isn't far behind, taking just 5 seconds longer. Nothing else, though, is faster than 30 seconds to render the PDF, with Covington at stock clocks taking just under 40 seconds, and the K6266 rendering it in 46.
you can see how close the K6 is to the original Celeron, and why Intel had a bit of a fire lit under them, as AMD was threatening to launch faster K6-2s at practically any moment. Anyway, that's a look at the performance of the first Celerons, so where does this put them in terms of a retro PC today? Well, slot 1 is still, generally speaking, pretty affordable, especially if you're not looking to get the absolute fastest CPUs or motherboards on the platform. For the same price as a Mendocino Celeron, though, you can just get a Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 of equivalent clock speed, and it'll perform that little bit better, being the full CPU, after all. If you've got some nostalgia for these old Celerons, they're extremely plentiful, and sometimes even available as new old stock. You can experiment with slockets like this one and try and run newer CPUs and older boards, or vice versa. Overall, as we've seen, they're not bad chips, but with the market the way it is right now, the only time a Celeron really makes sense is if you're chasing a performance edge on slot 1 or a socket 370, and you don't want to spend the frankly ridiculous amount of money that a fast Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 can still command on the secondary market. So I guess, in that sense, they're still fulfilling the same role they were 20 years ago when they were new, allowing budget-minded shoppers to get in on a high-performance platform for little money. I guess some things never change. I hope you've enjoyed this look at the first Celerons and where the product line got its reputation from. I'm definitely going to revisit them in the future, since the redemption arc that was Mendocino and especially Coppermine 128 was short-lived, sadly. If you have memories of building a Celeron back in the day, please feel free to share them in the comments below. We're all fans of nostalgia here. Thanks for watching, and have a great night!